Well, hello everyone. Please feel free to take your seats. It is so good to have each and every single one of you here in the room and every single one of you watching in and tuning in from online, both for those of you who have come to church this morning, either out of interest or part of uh, this community or in support for Tim uh, and Micah and their families as well. If I haven't met you before, my name's Mike and I want to welcome you to week two of our easy series where we're ironically thinking through the idea that in life, the most important things are rarely easy. And we're thinking through and considering how the implications of this truth are revealed in and through the life of a follower of Jesus. But I want to start by sharing a trend that I've noticed in my life, and I wonder if you can relate to the particular challenges that it brings. See, I've noticed uh, with increasing frequency that when I do head along to the supermarket, I'm a shocker at remembering to bring one of these. You know, the reusable shopping bags, I'm really good at buying them. I'm very bad at reusing them. And the pile have stack, has stacked up at home so much that the point now is I'm banned from, by my household from buying any more. And so now when I do rock up to a supermarket and I discover and realize that I forgot one of the most essential items that you can bring, I have to just learn to go without. Now, this leads to another particular challenge. Because along the way of picking up the things that I've been told to get, so, you know, another little set of nappies and um, chicken stock and, you know, organic almond milk that's unsweetened, it doesn't taste that nice, some black beans, you know, some ingredients that we've forgotten for uh, di- uh, dinner, not dessert, um, and, and that kind of thing. And then also, like, the proverbial milk, as, as well as maybe a few little extra treats um, that I see and grab my eye along the way. But what happens is, by the time I make my lap around the supermarket, I, found, I find myself with my hands full, unable to carry anything else in my hands. You know, I think that this could be a picture that could describe a lot of, what, a, a, a lot of how a lot of us feel about life at the moment. Like, oh, like we're overwhelmed. Carrying too much and unable to add anything else to the pile. The other day, I found myself in this particular predicament. And after walking a lap through the supermarket and lining up at the self-serve checkout because I didn't really want to speak to anyone and patiently sort of scanning each and every single item and then restacking my groceries up into this Tetris tower, I finally was able to start walking out the door. And by that stage, I was getting pretty frustrated. Patience wasn't at an all-time high. It was at an all-time low. And the family in front of me were taking their sweet time to walk out the door ahead. (laughs) And then as I get outside and I fix my eyes on my card, I'm about about ready to make that precarious dash there. Something catches my attention out of the corner of my eye. I notice that there is an old man who is struggling to return his trolley to the trolley bay. And he's having particular difficulty trying to get that little metal thing into the other thing to get his gold coin donation back again. And as my, my attention it gets fixed on this old man, I experience a bit of a personal dilemma. Do I drop what I have or try to maybe reorient everything and offer to help or do I not? And then the thought process that begins to unfold through my head is, you know what, like, maybe it's not my place to offer to help this time. You know, it's pretty inconvenient at the moment. You know, maybe someone else will notice that this person is in trouble. Maybe they have a spare hand to help out. And then as I slowly walk away, 
the process that continues to justify the decision that I'm beginning to make is that, you know what, this is just too inconvenient in the moment. And if I'm honest, I don't really feel like stopping to help this guy because of what I'm carrying and because of the disposition of my life in this moment. What should I do? What could I do? And as an aside, what might you do if you found yourself in a particular situation? You know, as I reflect back on everything that was going on and percolating through my mind in that moment, I think it reveals some recurring challenges that we'll all face in our lives from time to time. Because sometimes life can feel full and just taking care of the things and the people that we're responsible for seems like that's a load that's enough for us to bear. And so much so that maybe the thought of going out of your way to help someone else can seem like too much or maybe adding something else to the to-do the to list in your lives is unwise at best and impossible in practicalities. See, when it comes to seeing a need or seeing someone in need, knowing what to do and what not to do and how and when we should respond are certainly questions with no easy answer. How does serving fit into our lives when our lives feel so full? But the burden and complexity and challenges of a full or overloaded life isn't the only thing, I think that makes serving a challenge. In fact, I don't even think it's the main thing. Because if full hands that represent a full life is the main barrier to whether we serve or not, then how come serving isn't necessarily any easier on a day off, or on our holidays, or when we've got some spare time on our hands? You know, I think that lurking beneath the surface level reasons why serving isn't easy is a far more personal dilemma. Maybe you detected it as I was describing some of my thought process when seeing that person in need of help at the shops, because underneath the practicalities of whether I could, should, and was able to offer help was the point of whether I actually wanted to help in the first place. See, if I'm truly honest, the dilemma of deciding whether to help or not in that moment actually had little to do with the practicalities and far more to do with personal preference. More specifically, the dilemma had to do with my personal preference for convenience over inconvenience, comfort over discomfort, and ease over effort. I wonder if you can relate. Because I suspect that personal preference is not just a dilemma that I face, but rather it's something that influences every single one of us. See, when it comes to the question of serving others, the decisions that we make often have more to do with our personal preferences than what we can actually practically do. So here's the issue as I see it, because every day there are countless moments that arise when we see a need or someone in need, and there are ongoing and recurring instances where the opportunity arises or the responsibility requires us to serve. To serve in our homes as a spouse, a parent, a child, or a housemate. To serve in our vocations as a colleague, an employee, or an employer. To serve in this church partnering with the work that God is doing in our lives and community and serving in the one-off and the regular encounters that we have with others throughout the week. So many places and spaces, needs and people in need, responsibilities and opportunities to serve. The question, though, is when an opportunity arises or responsibility requires us to serve, How do we discern and decide what to do? Because serving isn't easy. And what makes it a challenge is not just whether we practically can actually serve, 
but also what our personal preference leads us when we decide what to do. When an opportunity arises or responsibility requires us to serve, how do we discern and decide what to do and what might Jesus have to say when we find ourselves in this dilemma? Fortunately, we don't have to speculate what Jesus might say because he spoke directly into this topic many times and addressing the tensions which lurk beneath it. One of the occasions that takes place uh, is, occurs in Mark chapter 10 where Jesus has a fascinating conversation with his disciples. At the point that we're about to enter into, Jesus has just outlined the uneasy path that he's about to walk towards the cross and his death, and his disciples are going to have a front row seat to it all. And this is the third time that Jesus has predicted his death. And as they're processing this news, two of his disciples approach Jesus privately because they have a question that they want to ask. Let's enter into the story in Mark chapter 10. We'll be kicking off in verse 35. And this is what happens. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, this same encounter is embarrassingly told in Matthew's gospel as well. The main difference being that there, James and John get their mum to make their request. And specifically, James and John, they want the benefits of privilege, honour and ease that they think they can get from Jesus. Because despite all of his talk about suffering and death, their view is that Jesus is something special and he just might be the leader that they've been looking for to overthrow the political system of their day. And they want to be closest to the throne and first in line to share in the spoils. Now, in response to James and John's request, Jesus just simply re reiterates what he's already said. He's on a journey towards the cross and things are not going to be easy for him and things aren't going to be easy for them either. At this point in the story, though, the question begs to be asked, what about the other disciples? Where are they in this story and how are they going to respond to what's just taken place? Well, we're told what happens, uh, what, exactly what they think as the story continues to be told in Mark. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And at first glance, it seems like their anger is well-reasoned and, just, ju and justifiable. How could you ask Jesus that question? Have you, have you got no sort of social modicum? But many Bible scholars, they point out that the ten likely don't become indignant because they're furious at the nerve of James and John's request. They're mad because James and John got their request in before they did. Because they too want the benefits of privilege, honour and ease. They want the exact same thing. Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's a potent example of personal preference on display, isn't it? Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And although the audacity of their request can seem so out of line... I've got to give it to them, at least they're honest. Because I reckon we so often have that same mindset ourselves, don't we? Sure, we might dress it up with some religious language, maybe like a well-balanced prayer or an unspoken expectation in our faith, but the sentiment rate remains the same, doesn't it? Jesus, I want you to do for me whatever I ask. Jesus, I'll follow you, but only if you do for me whatever I ask of you. I'll follow you, Jesus, but it's going to be on my terms, guided by my personal preference. Last week, Chris spoke into this human tendency that we have in trying to follow Jesus on our own terms and he reminded us that one of the ways that Jesus describes this invitation to anyone and everyone to follow him is with the agricultural image of a yoke. 
And you might remember that a yoke is the ultimate sign and and symbol of submission to someone else's will. And so when Jesus invites us to take on his yoke, submitting to his personal, submitting our personal preferences is part of the package. Following Jesus involves a daily choice to submit his will, to submit to his will in our lives. To to submit to his will even when it isn't easy. To submit to his will even when it clashes with my personal preferences. So what does it look like to submit to his will? Especially when it clashes with what I want the most. Well, as we circle back to James and John and the other angry disciples who are chucking a tanty, Jesus addresses the issue of their personal preference and then he describes what following him is actually going to require of them. Jesus called them together and he said, you know that those who are regarded as followers, as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave at all, of all. For a group of disciples who are preoccupied with their own priorities for privilege, honor, and ease, Jesus names the human tendency to put personal preference over the needs of others, and then he says, not so with you. Instead, Jesus takes the image and the role of a servant and a slave. And he says that's what their lives are to look like if they're to follow him. The disciples are to be radically other-centered, focused on meeting the needs of others rather than controlling others to meet their own. To put it simply, a follower of Jesus is to live in service to others. But Jesus didn't just say that serving others was to be one of the key features that ought to describe their lives. He also said that it would be one of the key features that would describe his own. In concluding his teaching about living in service for others, Jesus says about himself, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There it is. Jesus models a life of service for others through his own life and death in service for all. And his example sets the extent and the standard to everyone else who follows. Over the time, the disciples who first heard Jesus' words here and then later saw him fulfill them on the cross, they took his command to live to live in service for others so seriously that it became one of the defining features that described the early church. Some of the authors in the New Testament letters in the Bible, like Peter, James, and Paul, they began to, in many of their writings, to refer to themselves in their introductions as servants. And in his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul echoed what Jesus had to say about serving others when he challenged the Christians there and Christians everywhere with these words. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. It's the same command just uses different words. A follower of Jesus is to live in service to others. But what does this look like in your life and mine? This leads us back to the question that was posed at the very beginning. When an opportunity arises or responsibility requires us to serve, how do we discern and decide what to do? What might Jesus have to say when we find ourselves in this dilemma, particularly when our own personal preferences have something to say to it as well? One of the things 
that I'm so thankful for about Jesus is that he doesn't just tell us what to do, he also models the life of service that he calls us to live. So when it comes to living a life of service for others, Jesus modeled the way through his own life and death. And when it comes to what it looks like to discern the influence that personal preference can have on a serving mindset, Jesus lets us in on a little conversation that any one of us can have to help us decide what to do. This conversation really was just part of an ongoing conversation that Jesus had continually with his heavenly father. But in the, le- in the, leading, the hours leading up to his arrest, which would result in his excruciating death, Jesus has a deeply honest conversation with his heavenly father. He's consistently forecasted that one of the main features of his life was that he came to serve and meet the needs of all humanity and that that service would ultimately lead to dying on the cross. And yet in these final hours, Jesus, aware of this opportunity and responsibility to serve all humanity in the most costly of ways, gives voice to his own personal preference in that moment. We can read it like this. Jesus, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, the hour, the time of his death might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. In the heat and the stress of the moment, Jesus is able to honestly recognize and articulate what his personal preferences are, but he does not end the conversation there. Instead, this conversation leads him to making a decision, ultimately, to submit his preferences to the will of his Father. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. After discerning the way in which his personal preference was conflicting, was in conflict with the opportunity and the responsibility that he had to serve Jesus in conversation with his Father, he chooses to submit, yet not what I will, but what you will. Let me ask you this. What might those words mean for you? if you were to use them in conversation with Jesus about your life. What implications might arise if you were to use those words in conversation with Jesus about your life? Yet not what I will, but what you will. And specifically as it relates to the topic of today, as a follower of Jesus, what might serving look like for you as you submit to his will in your life? Some of you know exactly what that looks like already. Perhaps God has been in conversation with you about serving for quite some time in one or multiple areas of your life. But I wonder if others of us might see or hear that question and think, yeah, I don't even know where to start. What might serving look like in my life? I don't even know where to begin with a question like that. If that's you, then can I suggest a few places that you might like to begin the conversation in. Perhaps the best starting point is considering what opportunities and responsibilities currently exist for you to serve in your household. And if you want some clear and specific feedback, why don't you ask your spouse, your kids, your parents or your housemates how you could better serve them. You can take that conversation over into other spaces in your life as well, at your workplace with your mates and in other settings in the community. How could you better serve the needs of those around you? Another place is here as part of church. 
Interestingly, the church is one of the primary environments in which the New Testament writers specifically speak about Christians living in service to each other. And, you know, coming out of the disruption and challenges of the last two years across much of our church community, it is obvious that serving has taken a dip. Our teams and our groups which facilitate our mission and discipleship endeavours have all taken a hit. Our Sunday services and other gatherings throughout the week are often running with the bare minimum of volunteers and leaders and some aren't running at all yet. There's a huge need for people to serve here and across the spaces and places of our lives and it needs everyone to play their part. And if you want to discover or begin a conversation about what that could look like in this context. A great starting point could be you'd open up a conversation with a life group leader, a pastor, or you can submit an online inquiry via our connect link to get involved. What would it look like to take that question and ask it in conversation in the different areas and places and spaces in your life? But before you start, Before we start or continue a conversation with someone else, how about we start a conversation with the one who matters most? The one to whom our goal should be to say, not what I will, but what you will. You can start a conversation with the Lord with words as simple as this, Jesus, what might serving look like for me as I submit my life to you? And you know what? We're going to begin that conversation right now. Let's close and pray. Jesus, you know what our lives look like in this moment. The ways in which we feel overwhelmed and the ways in which we have capacity for more. And with so many places and spaces, needs and people in need, responsibilities and opportunities to serve in our lives, We ask you in this moment, Jesus, what might serving look like for me as I submit my life to you? You know, why don't you ask that question in the privacy of your own minds and maybe see what begins to stand out. The question is on the screen, in the room and online if you need it. Jesus, What might serving look like for me as I submit my life to you? God, for these needs and the people in need, would you continue to show us what it looks like to serve as we submit our lives to you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.